Father, thank you that you're a God who speaks, a God who wants to be known, a God who's proved that through sending his son. Uh, Father, we pray now that we'll think well and rightly about what it means to be free to serve one another humbly in love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, There's only one time in life when I've been known to have a preventative Panadol. What I mean is, I don't have a headache yet, but boy, I know it's coming. It's on the morning of a school excursion when you're the teacher. You see, school excursions, there are no walls, no doors, no gates, no fences, no bells, no seats. For the students, such freedom and delight. For the teacher, utter chaos. And the thing is, if I was to go on that excursion as a teacher and I was to have total freedom... I guarantee that the five-year-olds would be having utter chaos trying to work out who is the boss amongst these small people. We live in a cultural moment when people love the thought of being free. There's so many slogans that get thrown around. You're free to be yourself. You do you. That's your truth. We live in a moment where uh, morality is relative. What's right for me might be wrong for you. What's wrong for you might be right for me. Uh, there, there's a song in a musical which I think sums it up perfectly. Uh, Muriel's Wedding, the old movie, turned into a musical. Uh, Muriel's a, a troubled child who comes to Sydney where suddenly everything will be good. Uh, let me uh, read to you what they sing as she arrives in Sydney. When you get to Sydney, you will never, never want to go home. When you get to Sydney, you won't ever have to feel alone. When you get to be what you want to be, do what you want to do, say what you want to say, when you get to Sydney, you will finally get to be you. We live in a moment of cultural freedom. But the Christian gospel holds things in perfect tension. uh, As James has said, for the next three weeks, we're looking at Christian paradoxes. Two things that feel like they can't sit together, but they do. We think to be free means we do whatever we want. And to serve, well, that's an obligation, something I have to do. But today, we're going to hold them together. To be free to serve. So the question we'll be answering tonight is, how does Christian freedom lead to service of others. Uh, if you have an outline, you can follow along. Uh, first, we're going to see that free, we have freedom from bondage to the law, then freedom to serve one another in love, and lastly, freedom to be led by the Spirit. So point one, freedom from bondage to the law. Now, as we begin in verse 13, and we have this mention of freedom, it almost seems like you're turning up to a movie partway through. What's come before? Not just in this book, but in the history of God's people. You see, freedom is a major theme in the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, God's people are slaves in Egypt, yet then they are freed. But the liberation from slavery always always had the purpose to serve and obey God's law. From the very beginning, freedom from slavery was freedom to serve the Lord. And it's in this context that the law was given. God's people had been saved from being slaves, then they were given the law by Moses. In a sense, the law, in its original context was a symbol of freedom, even the means of enjoying that freedom in serving God. But there's a big problem, human rebellion and sin. Because of our sin, the law could not deliver. The law instead shows our need for a saviour. The the law shows us our sin. And that's why Christ came to redeem those, to liberate those people who are under the law. Through faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're freed from the law of sin and death. Not slaves, but children. As Paul will say earlier in this letter to the Galatians, you're not just children of Abraham, no, you're children of God. Earlier in this chapter, in verse 5, Paul has said this, 
You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? You see, in the church in Galatia, they had been set up heading in the right direction, as Paul had told them the good news about Jesus. But there's a group who's come in, who've cut in, and they're saying that for you to be truly free, you must submit yourselves to the Mosaic law. But Paul has argued, no, the law had a function. It was there for a time. It was a temporary guide. It's now been fulfilled. In chapter 5, verse 4, Paul says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. You see, to follow the law, as in the context of this chapter, is being circumcised, it's not how people are justified before God. It's not how people stand before Him clean and right in that legal courtroom setting. In an attempt to justify oneself, we alienate ourselves from Christ, the one who justifies. We are wholly justified by Him. To attempt to have oneself declared innocent by our own efforts is described here as falling from grace. So now, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Notice how corporate this language is. You is in the plural, brothers and sisters. And when God called you to be his own, when he identified you as his children, well, that's when you were freed. This is freedom from being bound in endless attempts to please God by our own merits. This freedom is the reality of every Christian. To be Christian is to be free. Uh, when you go to the supermarket and buy eggs, I'm sure you, you, you're aware there's only two options before you. Do you buy a free-range egg or do you buy a caged egg? I wonder if your conscience feels a little bit torn at that moment. You see, there's no such thing as a free Christian and then an enslaved or caged Christian. No, to be Christian is to be free. So what Paul is wanting to emphasize for this church is that Christ is the one who frees. He's the one who justifies. Christ saves us by his grace from the bondage to the law and its requirements. Freedom from needing to prove ourselves before God. Freedom to approach God, not, uh, not with fear, but as our kind heavenly father. So we're free, but what now? We'll point to freedom to serve one another in love. Read with me the second half of verse 13. But do, you not, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. You see, freedom can seem like an opportunity to do whatever we want. In an individualistic sense, I was a slave to sin... I've been freed from this, the punishment I deserve. Now I can indulge the flesh, do whatever I want? Well, no. The flesh here is our fallen human nature. The NIV note says, the sinful state of human beings often presented as a power in opposition to the spirit. It's our default setting. And our default setting is self-centered. It is self-interested. It's on about self-preservation. It's on about self-love. You see, where our flesh would turn us inwards, my needs, my desires, my wants, my feelings, my priorities, my dreams, my purpose, well, Christian freedom looks outwards to the interest of others. Verse 13 continues, Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Christ frees people for a purpose, not freedom for freedom's sake. And I love here that the service is left so open, which then means it can apply in different ages and stages of life. The, the, the service might look formal or informal. Do we serve people in church or in the community, in our homes 
Do we serve people privately or publicly, in visible ways or invisible ways? Do we serve individuals or do we serve a group? Do we care about people's spiritual needs or their physical needs? Is it a one-off thing or a continuous ongoing service? All this is open for us. We are to people who serve one another humbly in love. Now, one of the most frustrating things about living in Newtown for two years was trying to find a park. Now, what makes it that little bit worse is where I lived, uh, every street was a one-way street. So as you've been heading around the block for 10 minutes or so, you see in the rearview mirror that someone's leaving behind you. But you can't go back and get that spot, no. It's there to torment you. You head forwards, continue around the street, around the block to where that spot has now been taken. Frustration, even resentment for that person. How dare they take my spot? You see, I think what we're being challenged with here is that service isn't meant to be a one-way street. It doesn't say serve others in love. It says serve one another in love. It's a two-way street. And I think that's why we're being emphasized about humility, humbly offering service to others, but humbly accepting the service of others too. Christian service is a two-way street. And that then would deal a lot with the frustration of being so one-directional in service. As Paul will say in the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 9, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of God. We serve each other humbly in love. Read with me from verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are commanded to love our neighbor and through love to serve them. And this here is the heart of the paradox. The word here for serving is the same word for slave. Let me read a small paragraph that John Stott says of this part of the Bible. For, for, for from one point of view, Christian freedom is a form of slavery. Not slavery to our flesh, but to our neighbor. We are free in relation to God, but slaves in relation to each other. Now, doesn't that just roll off the tongue so counterculturally? I am a slave to my neighbor? We don't like saying that. We're free, right? But here is where we must keep freedom and service in perfect tension. You see, the law could never make people love. The law could provide guidance for a community, but time and time again, it would just simply show how, fa how, fall, how, how short we fall. But the entire law is fulfilled in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the love of God and neighbor was always the goal. God never changed the goal. The law tried to point to love, but the law could not deliver. And similarly, Paul will say in chapter 5, verse 8, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. As the law tried to point to love, but couldn't, faith now does point to love. It succeeds. Verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. In contrast to a community of love, here we have a community of self-destruction. And isn't it so visual? If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Again, it's that mutuality, each other. Christian freedom, that would simply be wrongly applied for us to be at attacking one another like that. You see, freedom in any community, freedom when you gather any bunch of people together, has the potential to cause such love, but also such hate. Getting people together can cause such joy, but also such sorrow. Such peace, 
but such worry, such patience, but also can show such frustration. It can be a place of great kindness or selfishness, where we see goodness, but also such harm, faithfulness, but also disregard for others, gentleness, but rashness, self-control, no, self-centeredness. So the question remains, what will produce both individual and corporate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Well, this brings us to point three, freedom to be led by the Spirit. Read with me from verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, the antidote to gratifying the flesh, or as we read in 13, indulging flesh, is to walk by the Spirit. This is a continuous, ongoing walking, following the Spirit's lead. This empowers us to serve one another humbly in love. But we must not forget that the Spirit is not untethered from two points. Let me explain. The Spirit will always direct us through the Scriptures. We must hear the Spirit speak to us through the Bible. And secondly, the Spirit will always point us to Christ, not Himself. So in keeping these perfect things in tension, the Spirit directing us through the Scriptures, pointing us to Christ... We can't have people think up things and say, oh, I think it's right for me to do this, which is contrary to the Scriptures, because the Spirit leads us through God's Word. Read with me from verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. In the life of the Christian person, there is a conflict going on. The flesh desires one thing, the spirit desires another. They are in conflict with one another. And because of this conflict, we can't do whatever we want, as much as the song from Muriel's Wedding, the musical, might want us to think otherwise. We can't do whatever we want because there's a battle at play within us. Paul will go on to say what the flesh desires uh, in verses 19 to 21. I'll just point to a couple of them, and I wonder if you notice how disruptive these things would be for community life. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, all these characteristics the flesh would wear down the community of love. But what is it that the Spirit desires? Or what is it that the Spirit produces in God's people? Well, we see that in verses 22 to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit... Let us keep in step with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the result of the Holy Spirit's presence and work in the life of a maturing believer. It's important not only to know what the fruits of the Spirit are, but to be diligent to attempt to make them an integral part of one's Christian life. But it's meant to be a battle, it's meant to be hard. No one drifts into Christian maturity. A couple of weeks ago, my dad, brother, and myself played a, a, a small round of golf. Uh, because they practice, they tend to hit the ball quite straight. Uh, I don't, nor do I do practice swings on I just simply put the ball on the tee, have a go, and lose a lot of balls in the process. You see, they had to work hard at their golf game. I haven't put in the effort. I'm not just going to fluke a hole in one. No one drifts into Christian maturity. It's hard work. When we look at people we, we look up to and they seem to bear the fruits so easily, know that there is and there has been a battle in their lives. 
It demands a yielding of our lives to the Spirit's leading. And again, the, the means by which the Spirit leads is through God's Word, the Bible. A combination of God's Spirit in producing fruit and cooperation of the will of the individual. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. I wonder if you notice all of these images so similar to each other. Led by the Spirit, verse 18, the Spirit does the leading. But back in verse 16, we're told to walk by the Spirit. We do the walking. We're told in verse 25 to live by the Spirit. Verse 26, keep in step with the Spirit. But all of these images have the same goal in mind. A life completely and continuously under the control and direction of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit who shows us Christ in and through the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit who sets Christ's love before our eyes. So I wonder if you're sitting here tonight and you're tired of serving You've been serving people for a long time. You feel like you're giving and giving and giving and you're worn out. Or maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're reluctant at the thought of serving others. Maybe you've been burnt in the past. Maybe you felt like you've needed a rest from serving other people. Well, thankfully, I think both groups of people need the same thing. We need Christ's love to compel us. You see, when we look to Jesus and see his love, we see his service. In the book of Mark, we're told, well, Jesus says, he did not come to be served, but to serve. And what did he do? It was costly. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus humbly served us and showed us love. He gave us life. He gave us our freedom. So we are to serve one another humbly in love. Paul will tell the church in his letter to the Corinthians, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he who died for all, sorry, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ's love must compel us to serve one another humbly in love. So the question we began with this evening is, how does Christian freedom lead to the service of others? Well, we've seen that there's freedom from the bondage to the law. There's freedom to serve one another humbly in love. There's freedom to be led by the Spirit. Let's pray now that God would help us serve one another humbly in love. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he lived a perfect life and freely laid down his life for us. Thank you that he is the one who redeems us from the penalty we deserve and makes us your children. Sorry for the times when we think our freedom means we can do whatever we want. Please help us to be people who serve one another humbly in love. Help us walk by the Spirit as he bears fruit in our lives. May Christ's love compel us to love our neighbor and tell them of your love in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.